Recording in progress. It's just great to have you here this morning. Uh, we're picking up in Mark's Gospel. Uh, we're in Mark 2. Give me a couple of moments to find it. We're in the second half, in verse 13. I'm going to read through to the end of the chapter. I'm reading from the ESV, which might feel a little bit different in tone if you're in an NIV or an Amplified or whatever else. So Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and and said to Jesus, "Why did John's disciples? Sorry, said to him, why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast?" And Jesus said to them, "Can the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is with them?" As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away. The new from the old. And a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into an old wineskin. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. And the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But the new wine is for fresh wineskins. One day Jesus was going through the grain fields, and they made their way. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, you never read what David did when he was in need and he was hungry. He and those who were with him, how they entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the Pharisees to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So Jesus has performed a a remarkable set of miracles. He's had his first feisty exchanges with the religious leaders. And now he's retreating again from the crowds, from the town, heading for the sea. And he passes by Levi, and it's this casual remark in Mark, almost as if it's by accident. But given that this Levi is also the Matthew who ends up writing Matthew's gospel, it seems pretty unlikely that it was by chance. This was a deliberate detour. A deliberate passing by of Levi's place of work. A deliberate chance encounter that would change Levi's life forever. And actually would shape Christianity through the rest of history. God doesn't do accidental encounters. His work in your life isn't accidental. It may look like it. It may feel like a chance moment. But actually he is deliberate and purposeful. And you are not an accident. And your life isn't a string of random events. His work in your life is deliberate and purposeful. And it always begins with an invitation. 
to follow me. Levi was a tax collector. That means he collects taxes from the Jews and gives them to the Romans. The Romans, as you know, they were the conquering invaders of the land. And the Jews considered themselves to be occupied people. Levi was a Jew. He was taking money from his own people and giving it to the evil occupiers. You can understand why this made him deeply unpopular. Similarly, tax collectors were known to levy more money than they were supposed to because they were allowed to line their own pockets with the extra that they took. They were so unpopular that they often required a Roman guard to keep them safe. And of course, the Roman guard served as an extra healthy encourager for people to pay their taxes and then some. So Levi was the lowest of the low, hated by his own people and actually derided by the Romans because he was a traitor of his own people. In effect, isolated on all sides, morally compromised, presumably backslidden in his own faith. You've got to pray on your conscience when you know that you've abandoned your own people, particularly for a Jew where their national identity was so significant because the Jews believed that God had special purposes for their nation. Those purposes were bound up with being their own people, occupying their own land with their own king. And here is Levi supporting the occupying nation, funding them essentially, as they prevent the Jewish nation from being all that they believed God had promised they would be. Think back to the promises of God to Abraham. These promises, they loomed large in the Jewish consciousness. And for some, that meant military rebellion. So we can read about in the history books times when the the Jews strive to to rise up against the Romans, the Jacobean revolt being the most famous. And they were put down with brutal violence. Brutal violence. And for others, it simply led to a resigned, yearning prayer, yearning for this promised, prophesied Messiah that would lead them out of the occupation of Rome to freedom. So a Jew who collects heavy taxes and gives them to the Romans, getting rich in the process, well, that's a Jew to be hated, and it's a Jew with a heavy conscience. But still, Jesus says to him, follow me. Mark doesn't actually tell us if there's more of a conversation. It seems almost like there isn't. Like there's this profound moment of eye to eye, follow me. Jesus had been performing miracles in the area, in that town specifically. And he was gathering big crowds and gathering loads of attention. So Levi must have heard about the fuss. He must have heard people gossiping in the queues outside his toll booth. Possibly even witnessed some of the miracles himself. Possibly, it occurred to me the other day, levied taxes from lepers and disabled people who now had jobs because they were no longer sick. We don't know who Levi thought Jesus was. Was he just a teacher, a miracle worker? Did he have an inclination that Jesus was something more than just the latest rabbi in town. Certainly the invitation was compelling because Levi gets up and follows Jesus. And to be clear, this is not a casual invitation. Remember, Levi collects taxes for the Romans. The Romans get rich off his work. So leaving the trade carries a level of risk. The Romans may seek to force him back into service or simply make an example of him to punish his disobedience. The Romans are very good at punishing people. They 
make a living out of it. Similarly, Levi is currently guarded by the Romans because the people hate him. So the minute he leaves the protection of the Romans, he's in actual bodily danger. Levi is hated by the Jew, and he is not welcome in Jewish company. And you can't just brush that off and say bygones, because the resentment is real. People have been on the breadline because he took more than he should from them. Some of the people traveling with Jesus were people that Levi had taxed. So that was going to be a tricky conversation. The instruction to follow Jesus didn't come with a road map. The destination was not provided and the route was unclear. Levi may even have wondered if he can trust this Jew that is inviting him to step away from his protector and his relative safety into the unknown. May even have wondered whether when they get round the corner he's going to get turned over by these group of tradesmen and fishermen. The invitation to follow Jesus isn't a casual one. To follow someone requires unfollowing others. To follow Jesus isn't a bolt-on to our old life, it's a departure from our old life. And it requires a shift in our priorities. For Levi, it was a kiss goodbye to his income, to his safety, and to his protected status in the community. Put down his quill, bag up the coins, roll up the parchment, step out of the booth, close the door, lock the door, walk away, don't come back. No guarantees. Jesus was a traveling preacher with no wealth, no army, no status. Likely to be here today, gone tomorrow. The instruction to follow didn't come with health care or pension benefits. To follow Jesus meant Levi had to step out of the tax booth and walk away. And we can lose the gravity of the moment when we reduce it to a bit of a kiddie story. We tell kids these stories all the time. And we almost paint the picture of, of Jesus saying, follow me, and Levi skipping off down the street, surrounded by pink fluffy bummies, and maybe even some angels singing the hallelujah chorus. Actually, I remember very clearly the night I became a Christian as a young man. I remember lots of random details to it. But one of the things I remember very clearly is waking up the next morning and my opening thought being, I wonder if that was a good idea. All the things I could have thought. I actually knew very little about Christianity. I could not have articulated the gospel to you if I tried. But I had played follow my leader as a kid. And I knew that to win the game, you copy the movements and the direction of the one you follow. So following Jesus, really following Jesus, was going to cause my life to shift in direction and purpose. It would impact my circumstances. Actually, I was heavy set towards a career in political journalism. Fascinating. By the age of 19, I'd had multiple work experience placements that I'd organized off my own back within public relations departments, with the, with the Mail on Sunday, with independent radio news. I'd written for the school rag. I'd written for the university rag. I'd done university radio. I was heavy set on that course. I'd met John Prescott and interviewed him. By the age of 19, I'd interviewed the whole British uh, rowing team. Matt, Matthew Pinson and Stephen Redgrave and sat with them like I was some big cheese with my little dictaphone. But somehow following Jesus caused a shift in my heart and a shift in the trajectory of my life. Not because political journalism was bad, but just because I was following Jesus. Levi takes a plunge. I wonder how will following Jesus shape your life? It may have already shaped your life, but you haven't finished following Jesus. Whatever your age and stage, you've not finished the journey yet. 
And so the question is still, what does it mean for you to follow Jesus day by day? Will you go wherever he takes you? Will you hold things lightly and leave them behind the moment you need to? I wonder, will you publicly identify yourself as a follower of Jesus who seeks to honor him with every choice and action? See, Levi's public identity had been tax collector for the Romans. And by leaving his booth, he is no longer tax collector for the Romans. He's ex tax collector for the Romans, and becomes follower of Jesus. There's a new identity overwritten, the old one. Just a little tip if you're a little bit nervous about publicly identifying yourself with Jesus. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I'm learning the incredible power of smiling whilst telling people that I like Jesus. It's incredibly powerful. Incredibly disarming, incredibly warming. Because anybody that says, I like Jesus with their head bowed low in shame, that's not the most appealing conversation to be had. And people are just going to move on from that. But do you know what? By, by simply standing on the edge of the football pitch or, or wherever it might be in the workplace and saying, I really kind of like him, people want to engage. People want to engage with something that feels fun and vibrant. So it's great for us to look people with the eye and, and smile. So yeah, I'm a supporter. Those of you who like football, very rarely do you look at the ground and you say, yeah, I'm a McLaren. You just don't do that. You look them in the eye with a defiance that says, my team's better than yours, and I know it. And that's okay. Even if your team isn't, you're allowed to be kind of belligerent about it, aren't you? You sing in the terraces at the opposition's fans. We make that transition from ex tax collector, ex whatever, to current follower of Jesus. That evening, Jesus dines out with the, with the biggest ragtag bunch you've ever seen. Tax collectors and sinners, we're told. It's an amazing kind of overarching category, isn't it? All the ills of society gathered together in one room. I reckon it could be a... Uh, a groovy new bar in the shabby, chic, groovy part of town. The tax collectors and sinners. Oh, let's go there. We can pay £25 for a craft beer and a deconstructed fish and finger sandwich. Maybe some green mousse on the side. Perfect. The disciples must have wondered what kind of party Jesus had brought them to. Have you ever been to one of those parties where you turn up and you're like, ah, oh, this isn't quite what I was expecting. Day one at the Jesus School of Ministry starts with insane miracles, big crowds, feisty arguments with other religious leaders. Day two is a dinner party with the scum of the earth, the dregs of society, the sinners, the lowly. Verse 15 says, actually, there were many that were still following along on behind. And in the midst of them were the, the scribes and the Pharisees who demanded to know, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? What is he doing? It's quite comical, really, because not one of them had invited him over for tea. Jesus was a nobody, a young upstart. They were not interested in eating with him. They just didn't want him to eat with anyone else. They didn't want the infatuated crowds getting ideas from Jesus and thinking it was okay to cozy up with sinners because their message up until that point had been stay away, stay away, stay away. Because eating with somebody bestows a dignity on you. Communicates worth. And it was an honor to eat with a rabbi. It was an honor to have them in your house. Jesus should be thinking more carefully about who he chooses to honor. He should be honoring the scribes and the Pharisees, obviously. Except, ironically, they don't want his honor because he's a troublemaker. But that wasn't the point. Actually, in fact, Jesus should eat by himself, preferably back in Nazareth, and make chairs. Do that. Much, much better. They couldn't understand why this new pretend wannabe rabbi on the block 
with making such a social blunder. If he wants anyone to take him seriously as a holy man, he should start off by keeping better company. Because company makes a man's reputation, a man's status. Being spiritually tarnished or unclean was contagious. Hang with the wrong crowd, and people don't just look down their nose at you. You get cut off from the religious ceremonies and the customs, and you find yourself on the wrong side of God's holy law. If Jesus is a Jewish holy man, he should know this. This is career suicide. Hanging with the dregs, these sinners, these religious cultural outcasts. Somehow, though, Jesus isn't too bothered about catching spiritual decay from the sinners of society. He's actually more concerned about imparting vaccines to the sick. They're not leading Jesus astray. He's leading them. He says, I came looking for the sick so I could make them well. I came looking for the sinners because they need a savior. I'm sat at the table with these folks because their need is desperate. And my presence itself is the antidote that they need. So why did Jesus eat with the tax collectors and not the Pharisees? Well, maybe it's as simple as they didn't invite him. Maybe the Pharisees didn't think they needed him. They thought they were better than him. They classed themselves as the doctors, not the sick. It's very difficult to treat a patient who thinks they know better than the doctor. It's very difficult to treat a patient who refuses every treatment and every medicine because they won't even accept that they're sick. You can't repent of your sin if you won't accept you ever sinned. You can't embrace a savior if you don't think you need saving. You can't accept the welcome home party to the father's house if you don't recognize that you ever left the house in the first place. You can't celebrate being rescued if you never acknowledge that you were hanging over a precipice in the first place. Levi chose to follow Jesus because he recognized it had been a long time since he was following God. That he had lost his way. That his heart was sick. That he needed a doctor. Maybe it was as simple as Jesus inviting him stirred a yearning in his heart to follow, to belong again. The Pharisees, as we know, completely missed who Jesus was. Even when he left a trail of breadcrumbs for them. Let me pull back. In the Old Testament, there are these three main offices appointed by God over Israel, prophets, priests, and kings. Prophets were tasked with speaking God's word to the people, which included proclaiming God's truth to others and revealing God's plan for the future. Then you've got the priests, who were the mediators, the go-betweens between humans and God. It was the priests who offered the sacrifices in the temple on behalf of the people. And then you've got the king, who rules over the people. Prophets, priests, and kings. Three offices. And by and large, they were distinct from each other. There wasn't an overlap. So the king wasn't a priest or a prophet. The priest wasn't a prophet or a king. Except Melchizedek. I have to flag him up. That's a whole other sermon. Probably a whole sermon series. But they were all used to shape society in different ways. And they were all linked to God's redemption plan for humanity. In their own way, they were each a foreshadow to the promised Messiah. Because each one represented a slice of his function. So within the Messiah would be the prophet function, the priest function, and the king function. Does that make sense? So in Mark 2... The Pharisees are quizzing Jesus on the law, this ancient law that had been laid out by Moses and built upon by generation or generations of Jewish tradition. 
And it's like the cut and thrust of Prime Minister's Question Time, in the, only in the public space. And it's a masterclass on Jesus. I love these interactions because the political journalist in me just loves the way he does it. And in the midst of correcting their misconceptions on fasting and Sabbath, he pulls on these three threads of prophet, priest, and king to bring this kind of flashpoint moment of revelation for anybody that actually wants to see it. So you'll know the name of King David. He was king over Israel. And God had promised David, your house and your kingdom will enjoy forever. Your throne will be established forever. Old Testament promise. And that promise will be fulfilled through the Messiah who would have the eternal throne. Verse 25 When quizzed about the Old Testament law, Jesus starts to describe, seemingly out of the blue, David entering the temple to feed his soldiers with food offerings. And just as King David provided food that was considered sacred for his followers, so King Jesus feeds his disciples on the sacred Sabbath. And he says, ultimately, the house of David will endure. David's actions were shocking because only the high priest was supposed to touch the altar feet. Only the high priest could eat it. But then Jesus isn't just king. He's also our great high priest. So the sacred offering actually belongs to him. The Sabbath belonged to him. Like the food on the altar would have done. Priests were the mediators between man and God, offering sacrifices on behalf of the people, and Jesus is our priestly mediator. His sacrifice, once and for all, will restore the unity between humanity and their God. One sacrifice, one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, Timothy tells us. And of course, we know Jesus is the Word of God. He doesn't speak the word of God as a mere human prophet, but is himself the word made flesh. He is the final word, the ultimate revelation of God. And in Mark 2, we hear the prophetic voice of Jesus, like this voice crying out in the wilderness, bringing unexpected revelation. I came for the sick, not the well. That's a prophetic voice. Follow me. That's his prophetic voice speaking over brokenness. Actually, in talking about fasting and Sabbath, he breathes fresh life into centuries-old traditions around concepts of holiness. And and his prophetic voice just blows away empty religion. So he's left this little kind of paper trail of prophet, priest, and king through this conversation, and they're completely oblivious. So he feels the end to just put the, the, the finishing punch on. And then in verse 28, he says to them, told you you'd hear this 14 times during his conversations in Mark. I'm the son of man. This this amazing ancient prophecy from Daniel, the divine Messiah who approaches the ancient of days, who has all all authority, glory, and sovereign power, who's who's worshipped by every nation and every people and every language, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, whose kingdom will never be destroyed. Hey, folks, here I am. Prophet, priest, and king, son of man. Generations you've spent observing the function of prophet, priest, and king because each one represents a slice of the the function of the son of man. And here I am right now. The Sabbath belongs to me because of who I am. So follow me. Pharisees, they completely miss it. They're too busy appraising Jesus to follow him anywhere. They ask three questions about Jesus in this chapter. Why is he eating with sinners? Why do his disciples not fast? Why do they pluck food on the Sabbath? In their eyes, Who you eat with is a signal of your status. 
your piety. Fasting was a signal of religious devotion. Sabbath was law, bound up in microscopic rules, and you stay on the right side of the microscopic rules, and you stay on the right side of God. And they actually have no grid reference with which to manage Jesus because he violates the markers for righteousness that they hold so precious. If you stay with the holy people, if you follow the rules, and if you abstain from food, starve yourself, somehow God might approve of you, and then you're in the club. Keep the rules, keep the standards, look good, be pious, then you're holy, then you're righteous, then you get approval from God. Those are the markers they understand. But Jesus says two things to them. One, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'm Lord of all the rules. I made the rules. You can't put a patch on an old shirt. You can't put new wine in an old wineskin. In the same way, you can't put me in that framework. If you do, I will rip it. I wasn't made to fit in those constraints. I will not be constrained. And then he says this. You guys have missed the point anyway. Because fasting and Sabbath were given as a gift to mankind not as a straitjacket. Fasting is intended to sharpen the spirit, to build spiritual discernment, enable our prayer muscles. It's a good discipline, like lifting weights in the gym is. But it doesn't make you righteous. Sabbath is nourishment for your soul. Step back from the work. Rest. Experience the beautiful presence of Jesus. Let the waters settle on your life and find peace, find shalom. Trust that he sustains the universe while you do nothing. Put all your hard work into perspective because he's the creator and the sustainer of the universe, not you. Be still and know that he is God, not you. But never be still and win enough brownie points to make the grade and consider yourself righteous. Be nourished by fasting and Sabbath, but never fool yourself that they make you good enough to match the holiness and purity of God. They don't make you righteous, but they do help your spirit. They're a gift. And the Pharisees got it completely around the wrong way. For them, fasting and Sabbath were rules to be observed and standards to be judged by. So no wonder they miss why Jesus ate with the sinners. Because just as fasting is a gift from God, just as Sabbath is a gift of God, do you know what else is a gift of God? His presence in your life. He sits and eats with them because his presence is a gift that can never be earned. Sinner or saint, tax collector or Pharisee, he graces us with his presence because it is the gift we could not earn. By coming up close, he dignifies us in a way that is out of keeping with our characters and our choices, but completely in keeping with his. He imparts a righteousness to us that was never ours. But he gives it to us anyway because he's gracious and he's loving and he's kind and they miss it because he's God. He's the son of man with the authority to forgive sins as we saw earlier on in Mark 2. He's the son of man with authority to adopt the lost as children of God. The creator The Messiah, the suffering servant, the resurrected champion, the ascended king. He draws us into relationship with him as a gift, a freebie. This is comical enough to make us laugh out loud. Because he would sit down and eat with us. The prophet, priest, and king, long anticipated. The son of man promised. Glorious King Jesus chooses to sit with us, not because we deserve it, but because it is a gift. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we we see you.
sitting with tax collectors and sinners. And Lord, we draw up our seat at the table. We draw up our seat at the table. We look around the room and think, what a bunch of misfits. We look at ourselves and think, I'm one of them. Rescued, redeemed, restored, drawn out of my own life, my old life, brought into something new. Lord, we look around this church and we see the gathering of of the monuments of grace. This is where we find our belonging, Jesus. We find our belonging here with you as our king, our prophet, our priest, in this, this family of ragtags. It's beautiful, Jesus. It's beautiful. I didn't get here because I followed a set of rules. In fact, I was in my own little toll booth doing my own little thing. Sat at the table with Jesus. Glory to you. Glory to you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Lord, there's a liberty here in this room because we didn't earn our ticket to the table. And we're free. Knowing that sometimes we stuff it up again. There you are again, still at our table. There you are again, still drawing us in, holding us, still calling us to follow you. Jesus, it is my my privilege to follow you. Lord, would you cause us to lock up the toll booth and follow you wherever it goes. And Lord, it's still true that the roadmap is unclear. The destination is unclear. There are no guarantees here except your scriptural promises. But Lord, we stand on them. We stand on those. We recognize who you are. Son of man, we recognize you. You're the long-awaited, long-prophesied one. We see you, Jesus. We see you for who you are, prophet, priest, and king. We recognize all that you are. And so we say we'll follow you. We'll throw in all our chips, all in on the table to follow you. Because it's better, because it's richer, because it's more profound, because there's a hope of glory on the other side. We follow you, Jesus, for who you are, delighting in you. And Lord, we'll throw off what hinders and entangles, and we'll let go of those things that hold us back. Because you're our king. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. worship you, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom come in this room. That your kingdom come in our lives just as it is in the very throne room of heaven. Lord, would you be glorified by our lives? Be glorified, Jesus, as we, as we climb up on the plinth as a, as a monument, as an exhibition of your grace, as we position ourselves as a signpost to you, would you be glorified, King Jesus? Son of man, would you be high and lifted up? Would many people around us recognize the exhibition of grace in front of them as we identify ourselves no longer as tax collectors and sinners, but adopted children of Jesus? Thank you, Jesus.